How's that? Does that look okay? Uh, it's an honor to be here, you know, and, and uh, it, uh, I grew up in Jamestown, so not that far away, uh, but I was telling some friends of mine here, it's been quite a while since I've been to, to Glasgow. I uh, went to school at Bowling Green almost, went to Lindsey Wilson for a while and then went to Bowling Green and, and uh, uh, have made a lot of trips up and down the Cumberland Parkway and, and several trips before the Cumberland Parkway was there. Um, but I want to jump right on into this. I've been very fortunate through the years to, to I guess, become a historian. And I really do think it's a fortunate thing because when I was going to school, I had no idea. I didn't major in history even though I loved history. Um, I, I lived on Lake Cumberland and my, my goal, my family had an Evinrude dealership and a boat motor store and I wanted to be the, the manager at Lake Cumberland State Park. And I thought I had everything in gear. Bluford Rice was over the state parks in the state of Kentucky. He died, the politics changed, and I didn't have a chance. So uh, I had to drop back and punt. But anyway, I've had a wonderful, wonderful life. Um, I do, I'm going to blatantly kind of advertise this book that I produced. Um, it was launched the fifth day of March in 2020 at the Bluegrass Trust Antique and Garden Show in, in Lexington, Kentucky. As we all know, within two weeks, the world shut down. Um, I thought I was sunk, and I really did, because it was a huge investment. I had wanted to do this myself. I, I didn't. I'd had a lot of people that wanted to help sponsor this book, and I, I just, I, w I wanted to do it. You know, Mom said always as a kid, it was me do it, me do it, you know. So it was just a furthering of that. Um, if anything, COVID has helped the book. Um, because it seems like with people at home, they wanted something to read. And Facebook and Instagram, which I'd really never been that familiar with, has been a godsend. Um, the first thing out of the bat, the Bluegrass Trust awarded the book, the Clay Lancaster Heritage Education Award. Very, very proud for that. And then not long after that, the, the Kentucky History Center awarded it the Kentucky History Award. So all of those things together is really added to the book. We've sold over 1,200 copies. Uh, we printed 2,000. I'm asked all the time, well, you're going to have to reprint it. Well, we're not going to reprint it. Um, the book, it's a book. You know, when you tell somebody that you've written a book and then when you hand them this book or they pick it up, they say, I, I didn't know you'd done this. It's 355 pages with over 500 photographs. And to give you some kind of idea, it cost me $117,000 to produce it. And that's photographs, the printing, and to produce this group of books. And, and that just gives you some kind of idea of how much investment. And I didn't do this to make money. The book is really not going to make any money. But this is a story that I wanted to tell. The objective of this book, of this end of the bluegrass, it's called Art and Artistry of Kentucky's Historic Icons. And objects don't become cultural icons upon artistic merit. Although I contend that everything that's in the book is artistic. They become I iconic by uh, the dramatic impact that they have upon our culture. And when they're imbued with the life of an artisan or the life of the user, only then can that object transcend itself and become iconic. The book tells stories. Everything in the book, if there's not a primary document, if I cannot document either who owned this piece or who made this piece, it's not in the book. But it's not about the artifacts. It's about the stories of these people. And it's their stories that provide the weave and the color to our cultural fabric. Uh, and what I wanted the book to do, literally, is to verbally and visually stretch this tapestry of cultural fabric. <laughs> Everything, I don't know how many of you are weavers, but you understand that there has to be something that holds that weave together. It's called a weft. And my theory is it's the Kentucky Long Rifle, this iconic Kentucky Long Rifle that's the weft that holds this weave together. Because if it hadn't have been for this number one tool of the day, the cultures would not have developed for you to have loved Asa Blanchard Silver or Matthew Harris Jewett paintings or some of the pottery that some of you love to collect. Um, 
We're living in an odd time. You know, we really are. You say firearm or rifle or gun, and a lot of people throws up a wall. I know the fellow that was helping me design this book, he said, oh, we need to put a rifle on the front cover. And I said, absolutely not. I said, the half the people in the world won't buy it if we put a gun on the front cover. But Richard Taylor is a past poet laureate of the state of Kentucky. And I had him to write the introduction. And when I handed, him a, I handed him a manuscript. He wanted the manuscript so he could write this introduction. And when I got the introduction back, I was so excited because I didn't know for sure if anybody would get it. I didn't know that if what I had written and how I had done this could be perceived. But Richard added this. He did get it. And, and he put this in his... In his uh, introduction. And he paraphrased John Adams in a, in a 1780 letter that Adams wrote to his wife Abigail saying that we must study politics and war so that our children may study geography and agriculture to give their children the right to study paintings, poetry, and tapestry. And that's exactly the theory that I wanted to pull and stretch in this book. I'm on the board of directors at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Art, and the president of Old Salem is a dyed-in-the-wool liberal, and he grew up in New York, and he and I had had some words about different things, and, and I had tried to explain to him, you know, my thoughts about firearms and the Kentucky rifle, and he come to my house. He called. He said, you know, I'm going to see my daughter in Chicago. He said, I want to spend some time with you. He said, I want a gun lesson. So we went down to the gun room and I started pulling things out and showing him rifles that had been made in 1760, long before that we were America, and showing him the evolution of these things. And finally he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, everybody thinks of this arm about what it can do not what it has done or the art form that it is. And his exact words was, is that the Kentucky rifle should be recognized for its aesthetics and not for its deadly function. Its historic use and complicated mechanics of loading in no way relates to the reputation of firearms in today's society. And there's little messages throughout this book that I try to make, and, and that is one. The very first chapter, it starts out about the Kentucky rifle. Um, it become famous in our day. I'd say there's none of us in here that's not what Davy Crockett or, or Daniel Boone. And, and you know, you go anywhere in the world and you say Kentucky rifle and people know what you're talking about. It's this long barrel flintlock rifle with a patch box on the side of it. Now you can say anything else, Pennsylvania long rifle or whatever, and you have to stop and explain. But this term... <laughs> For years and years, a lot of people, even as late as six weeks ago, there was an article that was written that said that this name come from the Hunters of Kentucky, the song, The Hunter of Kentucky, that was made famous by Andrew Jackson's presidential campaigns. But now we know by 1798, even after I've made this slide, this term Kentucky rifle was even being used in Pennsylvania. Not only the newspapers in London and Boston and New York, but we have found a document from a Pennsylvania gunsmith that gave a list of the different kinds of firearms that they made, and Kentucky rifle was one of them. This name had nothing to do with where it was made. It was to do with where it was going to be used. And the whole world was a buzz. If your whole world was the young America by 17 and 90, by 17 and 80 or 85, the whole world was a buzz about Kentucky. And at that point in time, it was everything this side of the Appalachian Mountains, whether it was the Ohio region, Tennessee, or Kentucky. Um, here's a, a broadside of the hunters of Kentucky in the line that was used for well he knew what aim we'd take with our Kentucky rifles. But this was the primary tool of the frontier. You know, every one of you, how many's not got a cell phone? Well, 20 years ago, would you agree with me that the number one tool of the day was the car? You had to have a car. You didn't go anywhere without a car. This day and age, I think it's evolved to the point that it's the cell phone. But this was the primary tool of the frontier. It put food on the table. Um, but as much as anything, 
it, protect, it protected these young immigrants into this new territory that they'd never been. You know, only the wealthy had been able to afford guns or allowed to have guns in England and or Germany. So the vast majority of the people that were coming here had never owned a firearm before. They'd never had to even think about an Indian. They'd never really had to think about going out in the woods and, and killing game for their food. And they sure hadn't worried about a, a bear or other things that would, uh, a wildcat or other things that they would might. So what's this? 57 Chevrolet. All right, 57 Chevrolet. Well, now why in the world would I have a 57 Chevrolet parked in here? How did you know it was a 57 Chevrolet? Grew up saying it. Well, by, that's right. By its design. By the, well, because you can tell it if it had been a 57 Ford, you could have told that too without reading Ford on it, couldn't you? Maybe. Well, a 55 Ford then. But you see what I'm saying? Okay, what I've done with this, in the book, I've divided it into chapters when I've told about the rifles. And one of the chapters are about Lexington rifles. And if you look at these brass boxes on these three rifles, they're all similar, but they're all different. But I'm here to tell you that you can go anywhere and if you see that patch box on a rifle, it was made somewhere within, within 50 miles of Lexington, Kentucky. It's that indicative of that, that subtle architecture. There's also a chapter on Bardstown rifles. Uh, the rifles that I showed you a while ago, Waveland Plantation was settled by the Bryan family and they're the ones that have given that Lexington school its home and its name. But a fellow by the name of, of um, Riser, Jacob Riser, him and his father moved into Bardstown in 1806 and they developed a style of rifle or brought it with them that's also very recognizable. And here they are together. The Lexington gun, this one is signed L and W Bryan for Lewis and William Bryan, the older sons of, of Daniel. A lot of times we like to call him Daniel Boone Bryan because he was Daniel Boone's nephew. But that's actually, there is no Boone in his legal name. And the rifle on the bottom is by Jacob Riser. But I think that you can see that if you were studied with these, that it would be really easy to tell if a rifle was from Lexington or tell if it was from Bardstown. Well, not only do we have rifles from Lexington and Bardstown, we've got rifles from the Barons. They're not hardly as congealed. They, they don't hold together stylistically as much as the Lexington and the Bardstown guns. Uh, here's a rifle that was made in Russellville. It's signed by Joseph Blair. Uh, it's obvious if you have studied these guns that Blair has studied with a Maryland maker by the name of Armstrong. Um, this is one of the grandest rifles. It was made in Bowling Green uh, by John McNeil. It's got a gold inlay on the, on the lock and if you've studied rifles you'll realize that the hammer, the cock that holds the flint is a little bit different. It's got a wing nut in the back. And this is, we've never seen this again on anything, but it, it worked really, really good. It's, it's a wonderful rifle with a, a great provenance to the Baron's reason of Kentucky. This rifle is also made in, in Bowling Green. It's signed by Andrew Carnahan. The patch box, I have no doubt, if you'll think back to the rifles we were looking at a while ago from Lexington, Kentucky, the patch box is really similar. Well, in the Lexington Gazette, in about 1805, 1810, the Bryan family were advertising that they were selling brass hardware for long rifles. And I truly feel like that the butt plate and this patch box were both made by the Bryan family and probably sold to Carnahan. It's a beautiful rifle. The, the book, there, there's a chapter on the Barons, but, and then there's a couple of wonderful maps. Uh, what I've tried to do with, with this book is to have short chapters. Every, like I say, everything that's in there has got a document. But I want it to be the kind of thing that if you're laying in bed at night and you're thumbing through this, and you think, well, I believe I'll go on to sleep, but if you thumb through and you see that that chapter is only three or four pages long, you'll say, okay, I'll go ahead, I, I can do that. I can stay up another three or four pages. And that's what I've tried to do. And 
But again, in order to stretch this cultural fabric, this tapestry, if you will, I've tried to include as many blotches of color across the bluegrass. And when I say bluegrass, a lot of people say, oh, you're meaning the Lexington region. I said, no, the entire state of Kentucky, if you say the bluegrass, people think Kentucky. Now we get here, we think of the Barrens and, and go on further west. But, um, and as if I was talking earlier on, not only are items iconic, People are iconic. Um, some of you have probably seen me do. I worked with the Kentucky Humanities Council for 24 years going around and doing first person programs teaching about Simon Kenton. And uh, he's, he's been one of my heroes. And uh, I guess I've spent a lot of my life trying to educate a public that Simon Kenton did every bit as much for the Western migration and the state of Kentucky as Daniel Boone did. Uh, William Whitley, again, um, over in Stanford, Kentucky. Many of you have probably been to this house. And if you'll notice on the front of the house, it says WW. And this is a grand artistic statement. And it, it goes back, you know, it's not, not only am I talking about these guns. When you thumb through this book, you're going to see that about 40% of it is rifles. But the other 60% are different kinds of art forms. And this house is so artistic. Uh, there's an eagle with an olive branch in its mouth on all 13 of the steps that's going to the upstairs. But to me, the most important thing on this house, you can barely see it in this photograph to the upper right. It says E.W. William Whitley's name was on the front of his house, but he adored his wife Esther enough that he put her initials on the back of the house. Um, well, but she was a great shot. And this is a rifle that was made about 1810, 1805, 1810. And if you'll notice, not only does it have William Whitley's initials, it has Esther's initials as well. So here is a, here is a case, if you will, that as early as 1785, 1790, you've got a man that respects his wife. He loves her dearly. And they're a team. And they've come in here, and the only way that they could survive is as a team. Uh, Esther was a great shot. There's wonderful documents of the Indians, the friendly Indians would come to the house. William would bet them that Esther could beat them, and she would. And then they'd go and get their Indian buddies and bring them in and bet that this white woman could beat them shooting. And she did over and over again. <laughs> Isaac Shelby. Uh, I brought some things today for you to look at when we're done. And one of the things that I did bring are a couple of artifacts that belong to our first and our fifth governor, to Isaac Shelby. Um, his canteen and his powder horn. And if you'll notice up above, it says Isaac Shelby, August the 2nd, 1786. That was the signature stone out of his stone house that he built in 1786. And in his diary, he carved that stone. So when you compare the I and the S in his name that we know that he carved, and you compare it to the I and the S in the butts of the powder horn in the canteen, we also know that those are his initials. That's his signature documenting these two things to him as well. I'm sure some of you have heard about this particular piece of furniture. It's a half a million dollars of a secretary bookcase. It sold at Cowan's a couple of years ago. It's phenomenal. And I wanted, my wife would probably die if she knew I'd included this side. But I wanted to do this so you could see how massive that this piece of furniture is. And it's just, it is. It, it's, it's a piece of splendor. I, it belonged to Cowan, Judge Cowan. And his house, if you'll see right in the middle, Cowan Station is on Filson's 1784 map. So a friend of ours, that actually lives in Isaac Shelby's home, owns Isaac Shelby's farm these days, bought this, brought it back home. And it's probably now within, I don't know, eight or ten miles of, of where it was made. Spectacular piece of artistic furniture. You know, I'm not going to go back. Uh, I was within two weeks of going to print with the book, and I had a hole. And that hole was, is I could not find anything that I could document that it belonged to Daniel Boone. You know, and everybody, they, you know, well, what about Daniel Boone? And you know, out of the blue, this, this beaver trap surfaced. Um, and I can't document that the beaver trap belonged to Daniel Boone. 
but I can document that it belonged to Patty Huddlestone. And the family legend is, is that this trap was given to Patty Huddlestone, whose that name is now Huddleston, and it is descended in the Huddleston family all the way till it was sold to Herman P. Dean that founded the, the Museum of Art in Huntington, West Virginia. So it was able, I can tell Patty Huddlestone's story and the story of him and Boone and their four or five winners of beaver trapping. I've tried with my presentation today, I wanted to kind of keep it as, as short as I possibly could, but I wanted to intermingle things that was in the book that had to do with this particular region. I'm sure some of you have been to the Hobson House. Um, when I was going to college, I worked for the city of Bowling Green for a while, and the city had bought Hobson Grove. They've got a golf course around it, and, and the house was empty. But we used to hide up there. We'd go upstairs and look out the windows to make sure it wasn't anybody slipping up on us and hang out for an hour or two and steal time from the city of Bowling Green. Um, but this desk is documented all the way back to Greene County. All the way to, not that it was made in Greene County, it's got all of the traits to have been made in Bowling Green, Kentucky. But we know, and the book tells the story of who's had it, how it was handed down, all the way through, and stayed in the Hobson House probably from 1860 until it was emptied out. Wonderful story. I know when I first wrote this, my editor looked at this and he said, I don't like this. He said, it's the early Smiths. People are going to think that you're talking about people by the name of Smith. And I said, well, we'll just put a really nice picture of things by a silversmith. And when I say the early Smiths of the bluegrass, there's a lot of different kinds of Smiths. A lot of these gun makers were silversmiths first. And they were doing whatever they had to do. Whether, you know, here we've got Asa Blanchard's in a tea set. Um, the, let's see, Edward West made the sugar tongs. Samuel Ayers made the big ladle. And that's a Thomas... <clears throat> I've forgotten who made the bigger. Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. Okay. There we go. But one of the neatest, yeah, Thomas Marsh is who made the beaker. Um, to me, one of the neatest things in the book is this particular fishing reel. I'm sure some of you are fishermen. Kentucky is given credit for making the first reel that when you turned the crank, it turned the spool more than one time. And the guy that done this, his name was George Snyder. Um, Snyder was a silversmith. There are several pieces of his silver that do exist. There's probably less than a dozen of these fishing reels. Uh, it's, you go anywhere in the world, it's called a Kentucky reel. His apprentice was Benjamin, um, let's see, Mike Meek, Benjamin Meek, and then a fellow by the name of Milam. But again, their story is told in the book, the whole lineage of how this group of silversmiths become known for Kentucky's fishing reels. The women of Bryan Station. Have we got some, some DAR members here? To me, this is, this is one of the most wonderful stories in the book. You know, the ladies of Kentucky, Bryan Station, become under siege, and the men were out. And they realized that, that their scouts had told them that they were, might have been as many as 500 Shawnee Indians that were hidden down by the spring, but they were running out of water. They also knew if this fort become under siege, they were going to try to burn it down. And they didn't have any water. This lady, whose picture is here on the right, this is Mary Polly Hawkins Craig. And she gathered these women up and led them down to the spring. They took every bucket, cup, noggin, everything that they had that they could put some water in and went back. And you can see very faintly in this drawing the Indians that are, are hidden back in the, in the bushes. Mary Polly Hawkins Craig was the mother of Elisha Craig of whiskey fame. I'm sure there's some drinkers in the crowd. You know, and Elisha's given the credit for being the first one to put bourbon in a charred oak barrel. 
Well, this powder horn belonged to his son, William Craig, who happened to be a surgeon at the Battle of the Thames in the War of 1812. Uh, William Whitley that we talked about a while ago, at 64 years old, volunteered and went to the, bottom, to the Battle of the Thames and was killed. And you better believe that it was William Craig with this powder horn on his side uh, that tried to revive him and perhaps help save his life. Um, this is the only horn by the Tanzel family that's ever surfaced. If you'll notice back at the bud, it's got a, a silver band. That's the same molding as we find on a silver julep cup that were being made at the same period of time. Uh, Francis Tanzel moved into Scott County near Georgetown, Kentucky in 1798. Him and his family recreated an art form. In the French and Indian War, these engraved powder horns had been the vogue and they put people's names on them so at the end of the day when they were handed to an ensign to be filled with powder, they could make it their way back to the original owner. But these wonderful rifles that was being made, whether it was in the Barrens or Lexington or Bardstown, if you could afford one of those wonderful rifles, you wanted a nice powder horn. And the Tanzel family is known for that. There's probably 25 horns that have existed by Francis, maybe 50 that was made by his older son, John. There's one laying on the table here. Uh, he was born in 1800. They left, moved to Hendricks County, Indiana in 1827. He had another son named Timothy that was born in 1809. There may be as many as 300 horns that he has made. Uh, but again, they were all made in Indiana and kind of out of my focus. Going back to the women of Bryan Station, you know, just in 2019, I was asked to come down to a rededication of, the, of this monument. You know, the DAR, this was the first monument that was done by women for women in the United States. Uh, the DAR, I think, was only a couple of years old. Uh, maybe it had been formed in, what, 17 and, and 94 or 95. But I just think it's so wonderful that it is still there. It's on private property, but this is still honored, and these women are still honored. One of the most collectible things in the state of Kentucky right now are chairs from the Kentucky Penitentiary. Um, I've brought a little child's chair with me that was made there. They're like the rifles. Once you recognize a, a pen chair, you can see one across the room. You can date them by the way that things have changed. Ben's my wife's not here. I think I can tell you this. I bought her a subscription to Ancestry.com. And her office is all the way upstairs. My office is downstairs in the basement. So she calls me on the phone. And one of our prized possessions had been this, you know, this penitentiary chair. And she calls me on the phone. And she said, well, you'll never guess. said, I really am. I treasure our pen chair now more than ever. And I said, well, what's up? She said, well, I just found out my second great-grandpa was in the penitentiary about the time this chair was made. <laughs> and he was working in the wood shop. You know, he may have made it. Um, a lot of the things in the book have never been published before. This chair had never been published. Uh, this is a, a drawing that's in the Kentucky Historical Society that was done of the Kentucky Penitentiary literally by a British officer that had been captured. And the detail is so vivid, we really wonder, because uh, there were still as many as a dozen British officers still in this penitentiary, and we wonder if it may not have been a schematic to help somebody to, to escape. Here's a couple of chairs. Uh, I'm right in your way, aren't I? Um, but, you know, here's the, the baby chair and, and then another one of the chairs. So. Um, I was fortunate enough to be at Jeffrey Evans' auction house when this particular piece sold. Um, it belonged to a little girl by the name of Mary Wade that's buried at Marabone. And uh, she done this when she was eight years old in 1835. Uh, I brought it along today because I wanted you all to see it. I wanted to kind of bring it home, so to speak. We are so close. It's obvious that she's known she was dying by the verse that she has chosen to put on this sampler. Um, and uh, I've tried my best to tell her story in the book as well. And, and it's just a, a poignant uh, story. Um, wonderful piece. 
and I'm sure that some of you can probably tell me a lot more about it than I know. So uh, we're going to finish up here pretty quick, and, and, and I want you to come and, and talk to me. Tell me things. I, you know, I, I'll answer any questions that you've got, but I love comments. I love to learn, and I'm sure that there's so much that I've not known. Uh, I know as I was writing this book, I didn't know anything about pottery, so I had to go to a friend of mine, Brenda Heindel, that had done a, a master's degree on pottery from Maysville. So she shared with her research with me, and I was able to do a, a, a chapter in the book on early Kentucky pottery, the earliest dated pottery that we know. The earliest piece is 1827, and was made in Vanceburg, Kentucky, and it's in the book. Um, there are some limners. There was an artist that come through Kentucky, and I just felt like that he, we, he for years he's been called the Guilford Limner because he started showing up in Guilford County, North Carolina, and now we know he was in this region of Kentucky it, uh, much earlier, as, as many as 18 years before he went to, to Guilford County, North Carolina. Well, when I was in 4-H, you know, and they would tell you how to do all these things, they would say when you start a program, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. And that's exactly what this slide does. Uh, End of the Bluegrass, Art and Artistry of Kentucky's Historic Icons. It showcases the colors within the cultural fabric of the early Bluegrass Strait. And I do that by highlighting the artistry and the stories of icons, material icons, and our heroic pioneers. With that said, the last chapter is entitled Tapestry of Cultural Fabric. This sideboard is made about 1790 in Frankfurt. The little miniature sugar chest, I'm not sure where it was made, but there's no doubt it's Kentucky. The pistol that's laying belonged to William Crabtree, a Kentuckian that went to the Battle of, the, of, of uh, Kings Mountain, come home and settled in Russell County, Kentucky, and his family. This pistol had descended in his family. Uh, the pottery is by Isaac Thomas. It was made in Maysville. Uh, the water pitcher in the middle is by Asa Blanchard, and there's two or three other silversmiths that made the beakers, uh, Thomas Marsh, and I think one of them's Asa Blanchard. Uh, Matthew Harris Jewett done the miniature on ivory that's on the little easel. Uh, the powder horn descended in the Robertson family in Russell County where I grew up. Uh, the little chair, I'm not for sure where it's made, but it's got a history provenance. And um, the painting that's hanging on the wall uh, is a little girl by the name of Nanny. Um, and I'll be, I can't think of her uncle that painted that, but I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, but he's a Kentucky artist from Louisville. Uh, he's famous for painting George Rogers Clark Bush. Uh, Bush. Anyway, there's nothing out of place in that photograph. It's all stretched. They're all splotches of color. And I've told people that's bought the book, if you don't do anything else, if you'll go read Richard Taylor's introduction, and after you've done that, if you'll come and read this last chapter, this tapestry of a cultural fabric, I think that you will get a glimpse of everything that's in between the pages. And I think that you'll want to take your time and go back through and read the entire book. I've got books with me today. If you'd like to have a book, they're $79.95. I also had, there are several people in this room that were supporting subscribers. In order for me to be able to afford to do the book, uh, we sold subscriptions for $275, and the people that did that got a leather-bound, slip-cased book that's got 32 additional pages in it. I think I've now got about 17 of those left, 250 were printed. They're 300 bucks a piece. The other book is $79.95. Uh, if you'd like to have one, I can sign it for you, and I also take credit cards. So, questions? Yes, sir. Where does the Settles rifle figure into the history of the long rifle? At the tail end. <laughs> <laughs> the Settles rifles were made in vast quantities, and they were made to be hauled out west. They were making like wagon loads of them and taking them, you know, basically to St. Louis and selling them, you know, for that western trade. The Settles rifle was to feed the family. You know, a lot of times they're called hog rifles because people were using them to kill hogs. And, um, but, you know, in this part of the world, that's the most famous name in the state of Kentucky is the Settles rifle. And they're wonderful. 
You know, I've probably had a dozen of them through the years. Uh, I was just curious, what kind of wood would uh, be specified to, to make a, a rifle? Any particular species? The vast majority of American long rifles, I'm going to say 80%, are made out of maple, out of figured or curly maple. The same thing, a lot of people call it fiddleback maple because it's got a stripe in it. Uh, a lot of different kinds of fruit woods. There's a lot of walnut guns. I'm gonna say a lot of the of the settles rifles, probably you can tell me better than anybody, what, half of them are walnut or more? Well, at least a third of them. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of the settles rifles was made out of walnut. Yeah. And the settle, I tell you, the, fa the, the story of the settles family is phenomenal. You know, we've still never, I believe it was William was the father, and I've still never seen a signed copy of a William Settles rifle and would love to see one. You know, the, the boys at Bowling Green and Russellville and here, and, and, uh, but that's a wonderful story in itself. I mean, somebody ought to gather up. There's enough of those rifles and enough of a story for somebody to do a book, and it would be popular. Listen, folks, I'll be around as long as anybody wants to talk. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. What a great program. Uh, please feel free to come up and see these wonderful with us. And uh, we will have our next program on Thursday evening, October 28th at 6 p.m. here and uh, the presenter will be Tommy Jackson highlighting the stories of uh, notable journalists from Paris. So uh, something that uh, really hasn't had a lot of attention in the past. It seems to be an interesting program. Thank you all for coming. I just wanted to mention I have a box of uh, woodworking tools that could have been used for making these boxes. Give me a minute, I'll bring them in. Give me a table, I'll set them up, and we'll go from there. How are you? Thank you for the presentation. Yes, sir, you're you very do? welcome. I'd like to purchase a copy of your book. Okay. <laughs>